I have seen the pace of your life. The stress. The anxiety. The constant movement. Rushing from one place to the next. Chasing after your desires. Or running from your fears. I see how you struggle. Striving to meet your needs all on your own. I see the burdens placed upon you and the burdens you place upon yourself. In the midst of this chaos and hurry, I am calling out to you to slow down. Be still and know that I am God. It is I who set the earth in motion. It is I who sustains you, protects you, and provides for your needs. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Trust in me with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid, for I will never leave you. Let your soul find rest in me, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. For neither death nor life, the present nor the future, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate you from my love. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Well, speaking to a number of you over recent weeks, one of the ideas that has come through time and again is, is that possibly one of the things that the Spirit of God is doing amongst us during this lockdown is, well, doing exactly what that video said, slowing us down, breaking the bad habits of busyness, the, the frenetic activity that for so long has robbed us of the space and the time and, and the energy that really we ought to have been giving to the Lord and to His people. And so as we, as we do this, as we slow down, as we come before the living God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let's pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Do you cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord, Amen. Shall we say together Psalm 97? The Lord reigns. Let the earth be glad. Let the distant shores rejoice. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and consumes his foes on every side. His lightning lights up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim His righteousness and all people see His glory. All who worship images are, are put to shame. Those who boast in idols worship Him 
all you gods. See, Zion hears and rejoices. And the villages of Judah are glad because of your judgments, O Lord. For you, Lord, are the Most High over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Let those who love the Lord hate evil. For he guards the lives of his faithful ones and delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light shines on the righteous and joy on the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you who are righteous, and praise His holy name. Well, let's answer that call to worship in the words of our first song. Come, people of the risen King. Children of Families team at MIE. Um, this is my friend Ebenezer. And um, welcome to our kitchen. This is where we're doing our part of church today. So. Now Ebenezer's feeling a bit confused, aren't you? Yeah. What is it you're confused about? Why do we keep singing about that lady? Yeah. What lady's that? Yeah. Joyce. Do do we sing about Joyce? Oh, rejoice. Yeah. Do you know what rejoice means? Rejoice means we feel or show great joy or delight. So that song we just sang was all about rejoicing in God. Hmm. You're not feeling very joyful at the moment. No. You're feeling a bit sad? And a bit bored. Yes, I think we're all getting a bit bored. And a bit worried. 
I think we're all feeling a bit worried at times as well. But we can still rejoice. We can still rejoice in what God is what God is like and what he's done for us. Is that a bit like pretending? I don't think it is. I think it's about remembering what God is like, even when we're feeling sad. Yes, you're right. God knows what we feel like anyway, doesn't he? There's a bit in the Bible where Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. That sounds good, doesn't it? But when Paul wrote that, he was in prison. But even when he was in prison, he said, remember Jesus and rejoice. I wonder what kind of things we can rejoice about. What do you think? Yeah, we can rejoice that God cares for us. Yeah. That he's strong. Yeah. That he died to save us. That's a really good one, isn't it? Anything else? That we can talk to him. Yeah. There's lots and lots of things that we can rejoice in, in even the most difficult circumstances. And you still feel a bit sad, but that's okay. That's okay because God understands that. But worship is something that we can do for God. God's still worthy to be praised. And we can lift our eyes to God and lift our hearts to God. Do you think you could do some of that today? You think you'd like to join in with the next song? Yeah, and you have a special idea about how you can join in, have you? Does it involve this wooden spoon and this saucepan? Yeah, would you like to show everybody what you're going to do in the next song? Okay, that's that's lovely. I'll just take that spoon away and now we'll say goodbye. Bye. Well, before we listen to God's word together, let's come as the, the people of God before our God in confession, not, not with anxiety or fear, but with a great confidence that, that the God before whom we come is a God who longs to forgive and to restore us to himself. So let's pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sin. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, Forgive us all that is past and grant that we might serve you in newness of life and to the glory of your name. Amen. Well, before we hear God's declaration of his forgiveness, here's a great song that we can join in. It's a song by Doug Horley and it really celebrates the love of God that, that beats at the heart of the gospel and that that holds open for us this invitation to be restored to him.
with his grace and nourish you with his blessing. May he defend you in trouble and keep you from all evil. May the Lord accept your prayers and absolve you from all your offenses. And may he do it for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Well, let's confess the faith of the church in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. And on the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, I'm going to hand over to Lauren, who's going to read for us these last few verses from John chapter 6. But just before I do that, let me just flag up one thing for you, because I'd hate for you to miss it as she's reading it. You see, for us, John chapter 6, and stories like the feeding of the 5,000, and uh, teaching like Jesus being the, the bread of life, the bread that has come down from heaven, for us, you know, this is the stuff of uh, all-age services and Sunday groups and Maybe even like evangelistic settings where you know, we're wanting to present Jesus in as positive a way as possible. But actually, as we get to the end of John chapter 6, it feels to me like there's a very different atmosphere that's been developing. You know, even amongst Jesus' own disciples, there's a kind of uncertainty and, and, a, and a grumbling. Yeah, you know, but th this is a hard teaching. I mean, who can accept it? You know, but uh, there's, there's, there's almost a, a total rejection of Jesus in the passage that Lauren's going to read for us. You get the sense that really it's only the, it's only the 12 disciples that are left. And, and when Jesus asks if they want to leave as well, like Peter answers, oh, well, Lord, to, to, whom, to whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life. We've come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Well, Roger's going to take us through this passage in a moment or two. Uh, but before he does that, here's Lauren reading for us from John chapter 6. Today's reading is taken from John chapter 6, beginning at verse 60. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is the devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon is Iscariot, who though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. 
Uh, Roger is now going to speak to us about this passage. Thank you, Lauren, for reading to us this morning. What a contrast it is since I last spoke to MIE. Nine weeks ago, I stood before those gathered at St John's and spoke on the opening section of John chapter 6, the feeding of the 5,000. Now today, without any visual feedback from a gathered church, it feels like I'm speaking to myself and the iPad's not going to give me any feedback. And I'm going to be speaking on the final section of chapter 6, so I'm just hoping there's somebody out there. But also, what a contrast there is between the start of chapter 6, with the feeding of the 5,000, plus the women, plus the children, with all these people following Jesus. And the contrast with the end of chapter 6 is that the crowds deserted Jesus. Why? It was a sermon. Or perhaps more accurately, it was failure to understand what Jesus, the preacher, was saying. So as we come to consider God's word this morning on this fifth Sunday after lockdown, let's pray. Dear loving Heavenly Father, I pray that wherever we are, Whenever we're watching this service, however we're feeling about the current crisis, I pray that my words will not hinder us from what your Holy Spirit wants to teach us from your word. May he encourage us. May he challenge us as we seek to follow Jesus in these hard times. I ask this. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now before we look at the final section of John chapter 6 and its implications, I'd like to share a couple of strands that I think run throughout St John's Gospel. The first, which Mark highlighted last week, is the way that John and Jesus use everyday physical items and assign to them a spiritual significance. When Jesus was here on earth, sheep were a common sight. And John the Baptist points to Jesus and he says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Find this in John chapter 1 verse 29. So the sheep. And then the first miracle that we have, Jesus, is at Cana in Galilee, where he turns the water into wine. And John tells us in chapter 2 verse 11, Jesus thus revealed his glory. That's his spiritual nature. And his disciples put their trust in him. Thirdly, in chapter 3, Jesus speaks to Nicodemus about birth and about spiritual rebirth. In chapter 4, where Jesus meets the Samaritan woman at the well of Sychar, he gives spiritual significance to water and to food. And then coming up to date in chapter 6, there's a spiritual significance that is given to bread, to flesh and blood. So in verse 51 of chapter 6, Jesus says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So there's this first strand of the physical and the spiritual. 
And the second strand that I think runs throughout St John's Gospel is an evangelistic strand. John presents Jesus as the Messiah, as the one who entered this world to reconcile man back to God. And in the introduction to his gospel, John describes Jesus as the Logos, the Word. He's part of the triune God and was with God right from the beginning. He is the Word that became flesh and made his dwelling among us. It's verse 14 of chapter 1. Well, why did he do this? Well, the previous two verses say this. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh so that those who will receive him and believe in his name can become children of God. And that final verse has in it both the duality of the spiritual and the physical. The word became flesh. And also this particular strand, the evangelistic strand, and those who believe in his name can become children of God. With the Nicene Creed puts it this way, it was for us and for our salvation that Jesus came down from heaven, was incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man. Now, I'd encourage you to keep these two strands in mind as you read St John's Gospel. Not that I'm suggesting that they're the only two strands that run through it. But I wonder if that congregation at Capernaum who heard Jesus' sermon might have responded rather differently if they'd have known about these two particular strands. Perhaps, as Jesus was preaching, the passage that was given to him came from either Exodus 16 or Numbers 11. We, we, we don't know which. But both of those two passages speak of the manna, the bread of heaven. And Jesus uses whatever passage he was given to speak about his mission, his mission that will culminate in his death upon the cross. So as Jesus speaks to them, we hear these words in chapter 6, verse 51. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Jesus is speaking in that final section of the verse about his death on the cross, where his body will be broken, where his blood will be poured out. That's the physical part of it. And if you want to accept this, and this is the way that Jesus is speaking, if you accept what he's saying, you can become reconciled to God. You can receive him. You can believe in his name. And it's like taking the bread and eating it, accepting it, so that you can become children of God and live forever. And here's the spiritual aspect of what Jesus is saying. In Jesus' sermon, He's challenging the whole of the congregation. He's challenging in the whole way of thinking of who he is and what he stands for. 
and as they hear his words, they find them hard to accept. Simply, there is a cost to following Jesus. And we'll look at that particular cost of following Jesus a little more. But in the meantime, we're going to sing the song, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Your name is great and your heart is 
Hi, so we are starting online alpha this very week. We've got a great team. We're all ready with our Zoom and um, yeah, we're just waiting for people to sign up. So um, I know a few of you have been saying you're interested. You've been speaking to friends. You've been trying to um, talk to them and encourage them. Now is the um, last few days to get that sorted. So look at the link on the Facebook page or the website, sign up and we shall see you Wednesday, 12.30. Please sign up. Uh, please be praying for that also. Thanks. Here's a trailer. Welcome to Alpha. I want to spend a few moments looking at the final section of St John's Gospel, chapter 6. Chapter 6 is the longest chapter in the whole of the Gospel, and sadly it ends on a note of discouragement. And the paragraph heading sums it up, I think. Many disciples deserted Jesus. Many of Jesus' disciples, on hearing his hard sermon at Capernaum, were not prepared to follow him anymore. They were not prepared to pay the cost. And we get the impression that almost all of the followers of Jesus deserted him, except the twelve. But we do know that later on there was a good band of followers who were present when Jesus triumphantly rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. I think following Jesus is, is easy when times are good and when it satisfies my needs. Like for the followers, when they were being fed, when they'd run out of food. Or perhaps even the thrill of them seeing a spectacular healing when humanly it seemed impossible. But it becomes different when Jesus gets personal and starts to challenge people, to challenge their rationale for following him, as he does in verse 26, where he says, I tell you the truth, you are looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. It gets harder to follow Jesus when there's a challenging sermon, as at the synagogue in Capernaum. So verse 53, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last 
day. What his followers found difficult, and particularly in this sermon, was that it was hard to stomach. Now I've had somebody argue with me while I've been giving a sermon, but fortunately that's not going to happen today because there's no chance of that. But I've never had anyone say to me, that was a lousy sermon, Roger, or that was a hard sermon. You're all too polite for that. But the response that this is a hard sermon is the gist of what Jesus' followers said to him. So we see in verse 60, they say, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? They found it hard to understand. They found it offensive. They found it undermined their traditional beliefs. And so they found it hard to actually continuing following Jesus. When we are faced with a hard challenge, a hard challenge perhaps about our rationale for following Jesus, when we hear a hard sermon, when we have hard things to do, hard things that we we don't understand, hard directives to follow which perhaps we, we don't like or even disagree with, then what do we do? Well, these were some of the things that the followers of Jesus were faced with, hard sayings. So what did they do? I think our passage at the end of John chapter 6 gives us three different responses which we'll look at briefly. And perhaps these responses are worth us reflecting upon as we face our hard situation and try to follow Jesus in this hard situation of lockdown. So the first response is that some of them grumbled. Now in our passage today grumbling that's the second time it comes up because it's been mentioned earlier in chapter 6, where the Jews were grumbling over Jesus' saying, I am the bread that comes down from heaven. And this grumbling later led them to arguing in verse 52. They could not accept that Jesus was the Logos, the one who came down from heaven. In fact, they were stuck in the physicality of what Jesus was saying, the physical side of the words that he was using. And they could not accept the spiritual dimension of what he was saying. They were not prepared to pay the cost of following Jesus. But then in this passage at the end of chapter 6, Jesus' followers are also grumbling to one another about what Jesus had said. And Jesus becomes aware of this, verse 61. Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Well, we're not told whether the group of 12 were part of the grumbling, but probably the grumbling was loud enough for Jesus to hear. Maybe some reasons why they grumbled. Perhaps it was an expression of disbelief. Disbelief of what they'd heard Jesus say. Disbelief or even doubt in who Jesus was. How could this man say such outlandish things? How could he claim to be the Messiah? Well, he wasn't the sort of Messiah that they wanted. And they weren't prepared to accept his invitation of eternal life, living forever. But Jesus knew what they were like in their hearts. He knew that they'd found it hard. But then he tells them there's harder things to come and to understand. Verse 62. 
What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. If that found his teaching in the synagogue hard to understand, how were they going to understand the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? That was going to be much harder because after his death, if he is going to ascend to heaven and they are going to see it, it implies that there's a resurrection. They'll find that pretty hard. I think I'd like to group this, this group of people as fence sitters. Yeah, they're part of the followers of Jesus, but they've not fully accepted who he was. They've not fully accepted his teaching. But let's give them the benefit of doubt. They've not actually made up their minds to reject him outright. They're fence sitters. But they're people who are not prepared to pay the cost of following Jesus. Then there's another section of Jesus, perhaps on the extreme. What Jesus has said was the last straw for them. And as a result of what he said, they decided that they would turn their backs on him. They would reject him. Verse 66. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Perhaps they didn't understand what he was saying. Perhaps they didn't want to understand what Jesus was saying. Yeah, when the times were good, when they got a free meal, that was one thing. But when they were faced with this personal challenge, when they were faced with this challenging sermon, they decided that they would walk away. It's not the only time that Jesus issued a hard, direct challenge because in Matthew 16, 24, Jesus says, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. There's a hard saying. Because it means not doing what I want to do. But doing what Jesus wants me to do. And in Luke chapter 9, right at the end there, and this is a passage which was very formative for me is in my teenage years and helped me to become a Christian. Because Jesus there says to people, follow me, simple request. But when it doesn't suit people to follow him, when it's not to people's benefit they make excuses they find something more pressing to do I've got to bury my father before I can follow you I've got to go and say goodbye to my family before I follow you Jesus there's something more pressing to do and they walk away they are not prepared to pay the cost of following Jesus. And then finally there's a third group, the twelve, the chosen followers of Jesus. How they viewed what Jesus had said, we don't really know. But Jesus gives them a straight challenge in verse 67. You do not want to leave too, do you? To which Peter, a spokesman, responds in the following verses. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. They may have found Jesus' sermon hard. They may not have fully understand it. But they are prepared to stick with him. 
Sometimes understanding hard things needs perseverance. You know, I've sometimes been stuck on what is a hard Sudoku and stopping, putting it down and then coming back to it and suddenly everything becomes clear. The answer is there. The solution's straightforward. And it may be that the Twelve did not fully understand the hard sayings of Jesus in his sermon until the Last Supper when the true meaning of what he said became clear to them. But the twelve at this time were prepared to pay the cost. And even Judas is included that, the one who is starkly identified as a devil, a false accuser. He is prepared also at this stage to stick with Jesus. Well, it's God's spirit that gives life. The spirit working in our lives that enables us to recognise who Jesus is, that enables us to accept him as our Lord and our Saviour. It's our spirit that enables us to believe in the name of Jesus and to become his children. And this is what John the Evangelist wants us to understand and to believe that Jesus has the words of eternal life and he wants us to know him as the Holy One of God. The question is, if you haven't already accepted Jesus as Lord and Saviour, are you prepared to turn to him? and to pay the cost of being one of his followers. Amen. Now Judy is going to lead us in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Our God, who in Jesus stills the storm and soothes the panicking heart, we ask that you will bring hope and courage to all who wait or work in uncertainty. Give them the hope that you will make them the equal of whatever lies ahead. Give them the courage to endure what cannot be avoided. We know that your will is health and wholeness. You are God and we need you, especially at this difficult time. Help us to remember that you are always with us, always loving us, and always wanting the best for us. Father, we pray for our parents, elderly relatives, and all who are old, lonely, and fearful. You have promised to care for all your children. So we ask, especially at this time, that you will be by the side of all those locked down and alone, those who have no home of their own. Help us to know how to do what is best for them. Help us in our decision-making. Give us patience and understanding. Give us also the strength to do the right thing and give us your love for them. We pray too, Father, for all those who are stressed in their home, those with insufficient room, those who find homeschooling almost an impossibility, those with poor housing, those who are nursing sick partners, parents or children. We pray for those in difficult marriages or relationships, that you will keep them safe. We ask you to help all who are burdened in any way. We remember the young people who are frustrated at not being able to go out, who cannot meet with their friends or play the sport they love. Stand with them, Lord, and give them the strength to wait until the lockdown is over. We pray too for those worried about finances, those who have no work, no income and no way of getting any 
those who have fallen through the cracks in the help offered by governments or charities or friends. And we pray too, Lord, for governments. Governments who have to make decisions without whether or not knowing that their decisions are right. We pray for wisdom for them, for the ministers, for the advisers, those throughout the world who need to make these important decisions at this time. We pray that you will help them make the right decisions for the right reasons and that those of us bound by those decisions will accept them. Lord, we offer you our feet, which are often hesitant and stumbling. Take them and lead them from the safe, familiar pathways out into the dark unknown. And as we walk these new ways, stay with us and help us. Lord, we offer you our hands, which are often weak and empty. We ask that you will take them and fill them so that they can help with the building of your kingdom. Lord, we offer you our minds, which we hope are clear thinking and true. Take them and enlighten them, so that whatever arrogant assumptions we may make will yield to a truer understanding of your will and your ways. Lord, we offer you our hearts, unbroken, guarded. We offer them to you for your wounding so that we will never again be free of your pain for this suffering world. Lord, here are our lives. Each one is one that is small and surrendered. Take our lives, dwell within us, so that our whole individual personalities may blossom with your love and overflow with your life, so that others may know that you live. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Amen. Well, we're about to, to bring this service to a close, but before we do that, let me just tell you that we're going to be taking a, a bit of a break now from John's Gospel for a while. Don't worry, we will be coming back and uh, finishing it off in due course. But next Sunday, we're starting uh, one of our Jesus-centered life terms. At this time, looking at some of what the Bible has to teach us about the life and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So keep an eye on the website. There's going to be some Bible study notes going up, some introductory videos that are setting the term up and giving you a little bit of a heads up on some of the big ideas that we're going to be navigating over the next uh, few weeks. And there's also going to be some recommendations for books that we can read together as a church if we want to study this a little bit more deeply. But we are bringing this service to a close. Uh, and let's do that with one of the great anthems of the church. Oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder, how great thou art.
just to say thank you so much to all of you who've been involved in bringing this service together. It's a huge amount of effort and time and uh, on behalf of all of MIE, let me just say how much we appreciate the way in which you've brought your gifts and abilities to bear to serve the church family in these days of lockdown. Thank you so, so much. Now, let me uh, pray for us. Almighty God, you gave your only Son for us to be both a sacrifice for sin and an example of godly life. Would you give us now also your grace so that we may always receive with thankfulness the immeasurable benefits of that sacrifice and so that by your Spirit we may follow in the steps of his most holy life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.